Coming up in this week in computer hardware, DDR prices are dropping. AMD drops a new card. Intel wants you to drop cash at a new gaming nook. And ZOMG, so many VR games at Game Developers Conference 2016. All that and more, it's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 355, recorded March 17th, 2016. So much VR for St. Patrick's Day. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, a Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, and most felicitous, whatever that means. <laughs> reporting coverage talk discussion analysis of the world of hardware and uh it's an exciting week ryan is trapped inside of a virtual reality demo um several in fact i'm not entirely sure ryan's going to be allowed to return to his beloved florence kentucky but we hope he will eventually be released from the clutches of the vr experiences at game developers conference 2016 which is taking place this week in san francisco um VR has taken over GDC for all intents and purposes. There's lots of other interesting stuff going on, including uh, Microsoft attempting to open up uh, gaming, you know, from the Xbox to Windows to all of the other platforms, a strange little olive branch floating out there for developers uh, and or for other consoles. I don't know if I buy it, it's going to happen, but we'll find out uh, probably in the distant future. Before we get into that, a uh, couple of interesting things to talk about this week, because there's a lot to talk about with VR and gaming. Um, Good article uh, Jeremy wrote up on PC Per talking about uh, an article from uh, originally uh, Nanya Technologies. Uh, Pei Ing Lee says he believe uh, he believes that RAM prices are going to drop almost as much in 2016 as they did in 2015. And if you haven't, uh, <laughs> I also love the the good news, everyone. Good news, everyone, except for DRAM manufacturers. Um, but put this into to context when uh, DDR4 came out. Um, you know, November 13, 2014, 32 gigs was running you $639.99, and now will cost you about 165 bucks. That is a huge difference. Um, but, you know, instead of, you know, we're not looking at a 75% drop over two years, but we are looking at as much as a 20 or 30% drop over the course of 2015 for DDR3 and DDR4. Um, and, quote, if Samsung, Hynix, and Micron ramp up new production capacity at a similar rate to Nanya technology, uh, then it could go as high as 25 or 40 percent. Basically, too much capacity. Prices are dropping. Uh, if you're a video editor, if you've ever wondered if 32 gigabytes would make your games run better, it probably won't. But you can find out pretty cheap. Uh, right now and a lot cheaper uh, later on this year. That uh, original article is up in Digitimes. And, uh, yeah, second half 2016, big, big price drops. If you uh, have been listening to us talking about the Internet of Things for the last couple of years, security continues to be one of our great concerns. And all too often because an application is created uh, by the manufacturer of a chipset, the chipset is integrated into a device, whether we're talking about a router or a light bulb or some other strange, you know, thermometer, sensor gadget, door lock, uh, and oftentimes very little work is done by the actual manufacturer and distributor of the widget that you're buying for your ever-growing Internet of Things in your home or your vehicle. Um, Trend Micro discovered vulnerabilities in the Qualcomm Snapdragon, Snapdragon 800 series, the 800, 805, and the 810 uh, running the 3.10 version kernel. Um, updates have been pushed out to resolve these on phones. Uh, and it was a pretty big deal uh, because this was uh, a vulnerability that showed up in the Nexus 5, Nexus 6, Nexus 6P, Samsung Galaxy Edge, Android handsets. Um, and they all have security updates, assuming, of course, that your carrier is allowing you to push that. Um, but the issue is that uh, attackers could gain root access to the device with a specially crafted app. That's a big deal. Root access means essentially they can do anything they want on your computer uh, or your handheld device, your phone, your tablet, your Internet of Things gadget. Um, this is this sucks um, because in many cases, people are never going to update the software or firmware for the device. And all too often, uh, software and firmware is not something that is particularly 
Well, uh, man, uh, not particularly uh, uh, thought of or budgeted for, especially over time. If you know, if you've looked at your router and thought, "Gosh, there's never been a firmware update for it," or "Gosh, there hasn't been a firmware update for it since six months after it was launched and it's three or four years old," imagine buying a thermometer that could potentially be a security risk for years and or decades. Um, Trend Micro is not revealing all the details of the vulnerability, uh, uh, but they do want people to be thinking about, um, you know, the Internet of Things and the chips that power them may not be very secure. So, you know, there's, uh, man, yeah, this, this is a big deal. Um, it will continue to be a big deal. On a more cheerful note, like I mentioned earlier, VR takes over GDC, and I'm going to try to not get too deep in the weeds on this one because I'm sure Ryan's going to talk about it next week. Uh, and people out there listening and watching are kind of divided. You're either really, really enthusiastic about VR, you're like, meh. And I'll have to say I was incredibly meh about VR until an Oculus Rift demo at CES last year where, uh, one, they didn't want to vomit. You know, they've, they've got the sort of total disoriented, uh, you know, uh, make me vomit into the nearest garbage can instantaneously problem. That's pretty much solved right now for uh, Oculus Rift uh, and the Vive and uh, the Sony PlayStation VR. Um, they've announced this week uh, 30 Oculus Rift games coming on March 30th. Uh, if you've forgotten, it's $599. It comes with an Xbox One controller. Um, Ryan has been up to his neck in VR demos this week. Uh, and he points out that Job Simulator, which is available for uh, both the Oculus Touch and Vive, um, you know, kind of ridiculous. Uh, it's 2050 uh, and a robot allows you to work because jobs, you, you, you go to the robot to job because nobody has jobs anymore. Um, Ryan's like, it's stupid, but it's fun. You're a line cook, you're a mechanic. Um, and the thing about it that makes it really interesting is it really showcases the platforms perfectly because it is a completely immersive environment you are working inside of. And the thing I keep hearing over and over again is, is to, you know, they have to dial back the game so you don't get completely overwhelmed, right? So, you know, if, if the normal 2D version of the game would go to 11, they knock it back to 8, they knock it back to 7. Uh, and by the time you knock it back to 8 or 7, the visuals aren't as intense in 2D, but they're incredibly intense in 3D. And there's just no way to portray a truly immersive environment uh, on a 2D screen except for talking about it. Um, but it's interesting when, when you, when you look at, you know, 50 HTC Vives, uh, HTC Vive games are announced uh, for their early April launch. That's $799. And one of the big stories coming out of, uh, GDC is, you know, or, or being amplified by GDC is everybody loves, you know, the Oculus, everybody loves the HTC, but the controllers for the HTC Vive really seem to be giving it an edge. I was talking to Ryan earlier and he said, you know, I can't really put my finger on it. You know, maybe it's the controllers, maybe it's the gaming environment, but, you know, the vibe just seems to be working better for me as an experience. Um, there's some funny games out there. Eagle Flight, uh, which is out on the Oculus. Uh, uh, this is kind of like the top five games that Ryan noted. Job Simulator, which we mentioned. Eagle Flight, um, it, which literally gives you the sense of being flying in air. Uh, you can move direction only, uh, but you're moving your head around to look around. And uh, it is supposed to be uh, kind of, they've, they've figured out some mini game kind of environments, some gaming elements to move it forward. The Heist, uh, which is going to be on PlayStation VR, Ryan says, is part of a mini game collection and you're riding shotgun in a car, shooting at bad guys around you. I figured out I could open the door to look behind me and it blew my mind. Uh, it sounds really simple. But opening up the experience, a lot of what I've, I've talked to people about is, is simply moving around in games, not being confined to a chair has been incredibly enriching. Project Cars, uh, which is going to be out on Oculus, Ryan says, this is how you have to do racing games from now on. And that is uh, just a totally immersive experience. You're in a car, you're racing, you can look around. Simple. Uh, but obvious. Uh, the Lab is a cool collection of stuff. The bow and arrow minigame used the controllers perfectly. And the Star Wars experience, uh, uh, as he says, as discussed. He's really not as disgust as in you. That's disgusting. But uh, as we discussed earlier, um, it's, it's interesting because there's everything from, you know, um, 
some of the simplest uh, flash games ever made to some of the most complicated multiplayer gaming environments out there. Um, you know, I love the fact that, uh, you know, that Valve uh, and HCC5 basically have a version of Fantastic Contraption that's coming out. Fantastic Contraptions is an incredibly popular flash game that allowed you to build weird things out of parts. Uh, and now they've basically moved that into a 3D gaming environment. Um, you know, and if you turn around and, you know, talk about the Star Wars experience, um, you know, uh, it's, it's taking it to a new level in terms of being immersive. You know, Star Wars Battlefront, um, the Battle of Endors, the Battle of Endor, not Endors, Endor, um, a full-on X-wing simulator based on the base of the space battle in Return of the Jedi. Um, look, you know, right now VR is expensive because not only do you need you know a six hundred, an eight hundred dollar, or actually you know a four hundred dollar uh, Sony PlayStation VR controller. Uh, by the way, uh, Ryan notes after trying the PlayStation VR, I was more impressed than expected based on the hardware available to it. Stylized game design versus uh, going for ultra realistic will make the, the difference here because obviously w when you're we were talking about the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, um, the GTX nine seventy is pretty much the um, pretty much the entry level, right? You're going to need a fairly powerful system for this, um, you know, uh, quad core core i5, GTX 970, decent amount of RAM. If you're curious, if your PC is ready for VR, there's a Rift compatibility tool that you can download for free and run, uh, off of the Oculus website. Um, VR benchmarks are coming in a big way to, uh, Basemark has announced their VR score virtual reality benchmark, and I think there are one or two other ones out there. Uh, Sebastian's got a good write-up on that on uh, PCPer.com. Um, Crytek partnered uh, uh, with Basemark, uh, uses the Crytek CryEngine, the Basemark framework. It can run with or without a head-mounted display. Uh, and it's basically, you know, another tool to use to test your PC for VR readiness. Uh, for use with head-mounted displays. Uh, what's interesting about Basemark, uh, it's kind of designed to unite the clans. That thing you're looking at right there is a eye latency measurement device. It comes with the full-on corporate version, um, but it supports DX12, DX11, HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, OS VR, um, tests for interactive, non-interactive VR, so like 360-degree VR video versus interactive VR games, uh, spatial audio or 360-degree sound. Um, and that's, you know, this is just a whole new area for people to start exploring and figuring out uh, what the performance requirements are. And the performance requirements are pretty heavy, right? Because you're rendering, you know, two screens, you're dealing with the physics and a lot of other stuff going on there. Um, exciting times. So enough about VR because we're probably going to talk about it a bit more when Ryan gets back next week. He's really enthusiastic about it. Uh, now, I think much more enthusiastic than when we were talking about it before. And, you know, also, for example, he spent the better part of eight hours in a rotating room spending 30 minutes with, like, each game on an Oculus. And being able to be immersed in the gaming environments uh, is a lot more interesting than reading about them or hearing me talk about them. So we talked about the Razer Core external GPU enclosure. Uh, that's the companion uh, uh, to the Razer Blade Stealth laptop. Although it is available separately, anybody can buy it. Um, any GPU up to 375 watts under Thunderbolt 3 with compatible devices. Uh, plug and play if your BIOS is adjusted to be compatible with it. They have uh, a price, $499, $399 dollars from purchase with a Razer laptop that's going to be shipping in April. No news as to whether or not uh, any... Uh, third-party laptops will be using it, but uh, the upcoming Core i7 Skull Canyon Nook, which has a Thunderbolt 3 port, uh, actually is certified to work with the Razer Core. Um, this is pretty interesting. Um, although, you know, when you look at, uh, we should probably take a moment to talk about the Skull Trail Nook. Um, it's a mini PC uh, with a 45 watt quad core 6th gen Intel Core i7. Basically, it's a super nook, uh, something we haven't really seen before. Um, Iris Pro Graphics. This is a $650 uh, 
uh, bare board or base computer. And once the, you have it loaded up, you're probably uh, talking about $1,000 once it's run out. Um, Iris Pro 580 graphics, 32 gigabytes of DDR4, 2133 Max, Thunderbolt 3, USB 3.1, DisplayPort 1.2, um, Mini DisplayPort 1.2, and HDMI 2.0 uh, will be compatible uh, with the, uh, as we just mentioned, the Razer Core external GPU enclosure if you want to use a full size GPU for gaming. Um, dual M2 slots if you want to get your RAID on with your on motherboard uh, M2 storage. Um, 802.11ac, uh, Bluetooth 4.2. Um, this is, you know, a pretty interesting announcement. And, of course, a giant skull on the front of the enclosure if you're into that thing. Um, but, yeah, you're looking with 16 gigabytes of memory, a 256 gigabyte SSD, Windows 10. You're about $1,000 on that one. That's going to start shipping in April 2016. Um Man, the other big news this week, uh, AMD, of course, uh, was at GDC. They announced a dual Fiji card, which, well, they actually announced, they started teasing the dual Fiji card uh, way back in June last year. Um, but when now we're looking at the dual Fiji card, has a name, Radeon Pro Duo, uh, $1,500 is going to be the price, uh, a pretty massive beast, um, they called it the most powerful platform for VR, and they're really targeting it at developers. 120-millimeter uh, self-contained liquid cooler, very similar to the Fury X design. You're going to need three 8-pin power connectors for the Radeon Pro Duo because it needs all of the power. Uh, quote, and, uh, uh, as Ryan writes, AMD isn't telling us much about the performance in the early data provided, only mentioning that the card provides 16 teraflops of compute performance. This is just about double that of the Fury X single GPU variant released last year. Clearly, the benefit of water cooling the Pro Duo is that it can run at maximum clock speeds. Um, you know, I, I love that they refer to it as the lifestyle, uh, but the Radeon Pro Duo, uh, AMD says, is aimed at all aspects of the VR developer lifestyle, developing content more rapidly for tomorrow's killer VR experiences while at work and playing the latest DirectX 12 experiences at maximum fidelity while off work. So, badass gaming card. Uh, I don't know if I'd uh, use it over a pair of cards in Crossfire, but that's something to talk about with Ryan next week. Um, Boy, that is expensive. Um, the other thing that came out of uh, the Capsicum demo, a word I will somehow someday learn how to pronounce correctly, uh, was the AMD GPU roadmap. Uh, AMD named the upcoming architectures. Josh has a good write up on that up on PCPer.com. And uh, Polaris, Vega, and Navi. Uh, Polaris, they say, is going to have two and a half times the performance per watt over the previous 28 nanometer products in AMD's lineup, um, which uh, is something that they probably need to do sooner rather than later. Um, no mention if Polaris will integrate HMB1 or HMB2. Uh, HMB2 is listed in Vega, the architecture after Polaris. Uh, and uh, Vega is going to be a 2017 product, and way out of 2018 is Navi. Uh, again, both the performance and uh, in improvement in performance per watt, as well as the inclusion of a new memory technology behind HBM. Could be hybrid memory cube, uh, way, way out. Could be a 10 nanometer part, um, but there's very, very little information overall on that. Uh, you know, HBM1 being used in high-end parts doesn't seem to be showing up in some of the less expensive, uh, or the high bandwidth memory in some of the less expensive parts. Um, it will be interesting to see what is going on uh, over, the next, uh, over the next year with AMD. So we will see. We will see. By the way, if you're looking at building uh, your your machine, building up your machine, get your 970, 980 Ti on, your, your 390, whatever it is you're looking at uh, for your virtual reality gaming platform. Um, and I'm also, I got to say, one of the things Ryan and I were talking about was how long it's going to be before uh, 3D headsets get down to that sort of $200, $300 level um, where they're pretty much affordable for everyone, uh, which is something nobody's really speculating on right now. Uh, but while we're talking about building up systems, uh, we expect announcements from NVIDIA in April. 
Uh, so if you're thinking about spending all the money on a GPU, uh, if it's an NVIDIA GPU, you might want to wait a couple weeks before you whip out the credit card. So we should probably talk about one last thing before we go. And, and I apologize for the short show, but we will probably have an extra long show next week when Ryan gets back. Uh, MSI made an interesting announcement at, uh, or I should say MSI started shipping uh, during the Game Developers Conference, Vortex. Um, they first showed it off at CES 2016. 10.5 inches high. Uh, you know, it kind of reminds me of a certain Mac Pro from Apple. Uh, weighing as little as 8.8 .8 pounds, measuring it at 6.5 liters, the Vortex pushes more power per inch than most mid to full size tower gaming PCs without having to deal with the same bulkiness or weight. Uh, it's pretty, it's small. Uh, you know, you're basically running an Intel Core i7-6700K, um, Z170 chipset, 32 gigabytes of RAM or 16 gigabytes of RAM, depending on the configuration, uh, dual GeForce GTX 980 or dual GeForce GTX 960s, uh, depending on which configuration you do, four 256 gigabyte PCIe Gen 3 SSDs, uh, two 120 gigabyte SSDs, plus one terabyte uh, SATA 7200 RPM, eight hard disk drive, uh, dual killer E2400 NICs, um, two Thunderbolt ports, USB 3.0 times four, so four USB 3.0 ports, um, $4,000 for the dual GeForce GTX 980 SLI version, $2,200 for the dual GeForce GTX 960 SLI. Uh, one, you're talking about a top-of-the-line chip, a top-of-the-line chip set, an unbelievable amount of storage. Um, you know, so the, uh, the uh, RAM, of course, has gotten cheaper, but a lot of what you're paying for is right there. Look at that crazy layout. Um, this is pretty epic, and it's going to be interesting. I, I'll be very curious to hear how well they manage the airflow inside of that and uh, and what it sounds like when it's running at full tilt. Um, available for purchase up on Amazon.com, but it says it usually ships uh, in two to five weeks. So if you want a ridiculous, over-the-top, ready-to-go, uh, out-of-the-box probably as fast as anything else you're going to get as long as the thermals are there. Uh, you can get a little tiny box with a metric ton of performance inside of it from MSI. That's the Vortex. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, I hope it wasn't too much of my voice, uh, but we wanted to get a show out to you. And uh, if you've got questions about VR, and we're kind of curious if you do, because people are either very excited about it or very not excited about it. Do us a favor. Uh, hit us a tweet at Patrick Norton, at Ryan Shrout on the Twitter, uh, or you can email twitch at twit.tv and just put VR question in the line. Or if you're just over VR, send us an email that says VR sucks uh, in the subject line, and we'll get to you on that. PCPro.com is where you can find Ryan's writing this week from GDC. He's thinking about it a lot, not doing a lot of writing. He's going to be doing more uh, uh, kind of discussion on it in the next couple of weeks. He's got the headsets coming in, uh, and he'll be doing some analysis on that. You can find more of myself at techthing.com. A um, ton of GPS stuff next week and uh, networking stuff because I've lost my mind. And apparently network testing and road tripping to look at GPS apps or what have me. Uh, really amused this week. And hopefully that'll amuse you too. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching or listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, and I'll join you with a co-host next week.